that go had cockle burrs stuck in her hair. So I knew she'd come from Hunts Valley on account of that's the only place where there are any cockle burrs grow. Didn't even think to look for any on the man, but I combed red clean last night. He rubbed up against this man's pants, and when he come back to me, there were cockle burrs in his hair too. Come on up and get your man, Mr. Bailey, but you'll have to bring him back alone. Pappy's sick, and I got work to do. There's two deer in the beech woods, and I got to take Asa and bring him out. Chapter 9 Trapline Pirate It was dark when Danny led Asa out of the beech woods and up to the maple tree in the pasture. The doe and buck were dragging behind the mule, sliding like sleds over the soft snow. Danny hung them in the tree and for a moment stood there with one hand on the buck's frozen carcass. A warm feeling crept through him. Life in the beech woods might be hard, harsh, and dangerous, but only the strong survived there, and Danny felt a swelling pride as that fact was driven home to him. The dead buck, hung by its antlers and swinging gently in the wind, was more than just another deer. It was another achievement, another victory, an assurance that he was strong. Danny stabled and fed Asa and went into the cabin. Ross was sitting in front of the stove and Danny's hot summer simmered on it. Brad threw himself down on his bed. Danny felt like doing the same, but a man just couldn't give way to weariness. He sat down to eat his meal and leaned back to sigh. Hard day, Ross inquired. Danny shrugged. There was a lot to do. Neither spoke any more of the day's incidents. What was past was done with. What lay ahead was what was important. Ross drank a glass of water and coughed. Danny looked at him. How you feeling? Better. I'll be all set in a couple more days. It's hard to set in, but I reckon it was a foolishness to want to get out. It sure was. I'm glad you're seeing it that way. You aiming to run Stony Lonesome come morning? Yep. All of it? Danny hesitated. Stony Lonesome was a long line. When travel was good and unencumbered by snow, it was possible to leave the shanty in the beech woods at half past two in the morning, go to the end of the Stony Lonesome line, and be back by dark. But with snow on the ground, Stony Lonesome was a two day line. Danny looked keenly at Ross. That depends on how you're feeling. I'm all right, Ross said. I can take care of Asa and the milking. You sure? Certain sure, Ross grinned. Don't be such a fuss budget. Well, I reckon I might as well run all of it. You might as well. I'll make you a pack. When dawn came, Danny was far up the mountain. He swung the pack on his shoulders a little to one side and shifted the ax that hung from his belt so that its wooden handle would not continue to rub the same place on his hip. He brought one narrow web snowshoe up once beside the other and turned to look back at Red. How you like winter in the wind tappy, Red? Sure enough is here. The big red setter, walking where Danny had packed the snow and stepping over to the intervening ridges, came up and sat down on the tail ends of Danny's snowshoes. He raised his head and wagged his plumed tail gently back and forth as Danny slipped one mitten off and reached down to tickle his ears. Danny looked over the dog, down into the valley that yawned below him at the winter stripped beech trees that rattled gauntly in the wind. It was cold, but not so cold that the foxes wouldn't be running or that the little white ermine sneaking through the thickets in their eternal quest for something to kill. A worried little frown creased Danny's brow. The cabin in the beech woods was three hours snowshoeing from this point, but Ross would be all right. Danny stooped to pry the ice out of his snowshoe harness and one by one lifted the paws of the red setter to dig out any ice that might have collected on them. He was proud of red. You took a hound along on a tramp line and the first thing you knew he was stealing bait or leaving his scent around a fox trap or blundering into the trap and howling to be let out but it was, had taken only two days to teach Red all about traps. Of course, the dog wasn't much help on a trap line, but it was a lot of comfort to have company up here. 
and a man never could tell what might happen when he was out this way. Danny thought again of Ross back in the cabin, and a little grin played upon his lips. Danny himself had set most of the traps on Stony Lonesome, and so far they had taken most of the fur that Ross had brought in. But, so far, Ross had run the line and reset the sprung traps. This time, if Danny could reset sprung traps himself and take a heavy catch of fur when they ran the line again, he would have a lot to say as to who was the real trapper of the family. The friendly rivalry between himself and Ross had existed for seven years now. Ever since, as a boy of ten, Danny had first gone out on the long trap lines. Dog, he said with mock severity, if you'll heave yourself off my webs, we'll get on. That's a smart way to the end of this here line, and we won't hit the line cabin before dark. Come what may. Danny resumed his journey up the ridge, bending his head against the gale that roared down it. Waiting until he got underway and again stepping carefully in the snowshoe tracks, Red followed. A snowshoe rabbit hopped across the trail in front of him and Danny thought wistfully of the 22 rifle he had left back in the cabin. But he had enough to eat and every ounce of weight counted on the trap line. If a man picked up a heavy load of foxes to be pelted, he had enough to carry. The trail cut sharply upward along the side of a shallow gully that sloped from the top of Stony Lonesome. Danny saw a jack pine beside the trail with three blazes on its gnarled trunk. He stooped, shaded his eyes with his hands while he peered across the gully at an unfreezing spring where there was a water set for a fox. Nothing had disturbed the trap. With red padding behind him, he resumed his journey and broke over the top of the mountain. The character of the country changed abruptly. The valleys were laden with massive beech trees. Further up, the mountainside supported groves of aspen and an occasional jack pine. But here on top, a veritable jungle of twisted laurel covered everything. Only an occasional pine reared above it, and the only way through was on the path that Danny and Ross kept open. But the laurel was the abode of numberless rabbits both cottontail and snowshoe. Foxes and weasels had gathered to live on the rabbits, and an occasional marten or fisher drifted through. Useless for any other purpose, the top of the stony lonesome was a trapper's paradise. Danny started snowshoeing along the twisted snake-like trail. Presently, 20 feet ahead, he saw another of the triple blazed trees that marked a trap in the bush. Red plunged around and ahead of him, wallowing chest deep through the piled snow. Suddenly, the dog's tail stiffened and a snarl rippled from his throat. Danny slipped a mitten from his hand and let it dangle from the string around his neck. He drew the belt axe from its sheath and with it in his hand crept forward. Carefully, the axe poised. He went into the brush and came to the set. Another snarl gurgled from Red's throat. And the big red dog edged around Danny to stand with his tail stiff and his hackles raised. Danny paused, the axe held high, while his eyes darted around the brush and back to the fox set. The two traps that composed it had been carefully buried in the snow and covered with tissue paper so they would not freeze. The bait... A scented bit of snowshoe rabbit had hung over the set, but now, for ten feet around, the snow was beaten down and stained with blood. Bits of red fur and particles of flesh were scattered about. The two traps hung over a brush, and from them dangled the ripped carcass of what had been a fine red fox. Danny advanced, knelt beside the fox, and examined it closely. Its pelt was torn beyond all hope of repair and even half of its red tail had been bitten off. A rank, musky odor defiled the air, and the traps had been scored by sharp teeth. Danny twirled the axe in his hands and spoke softly to the dog, Engine Devil. With his hands, he pressed down the springs of the two traps, let the fox slide from them into the snow and put the traps in his pack. Not often did an Indian devil, or wolverine, invade the Wintappy, 
But when one did and found a trap line, the unfortunate trapper had either to kill the pirate or pull his traps. Danny looked angrily across the laurel and spoke again to the dog. Engine devil by criminy. It was bad, very bad. Four years ago, another wolverine had come into the Wintappy and established a run on two lines of Ross's fox traps. Ross had set for it every trap that a lifetime spent in the woods had revealed to him. But still, the engine devil had triumphed. That year, Ross and Danny had taken less than half their normal catch of fur, and summer had brought lean times to the cabin in the beech woods. Red stalked forward, plowing through the deep snow. He stopped beside a laurel bush and whined softly and waited for Danny to advance to his side. The wolverine had left the ruin set here, and the broad trail plowed by its stubby body was plain where it had gone into the laurel. Danny looked speculatively back toward the cabin in the beech woods. His father's hounds, taking a, fresh, a trail so fresh, might bay their quarry, but it would take three hours to get the hounds and three more to bring them back here. Nothing was more diabolically cunning than a wolverine. If the hounds took a trail six hours old, they would stand little chance of overtaking the Indian devil. Beside, there was the rest of the traps to think of. This was the Wolverine's first appearance on the line. He might not have found all the traps. The thing to do was make the rounds, take any good pelts that were in the traps, then come back with the hounds to try and hunt the Wolverine down. Danny snowshoed back to the trail and set off down it at a fast pace. For a little space, Red crowded ahead to plunge through the deep snow beside him, and Danny let his mittened hand trail along the Red Setter's back. But the going was too rough. Red dropped back and began to walk where Danny's snowshoes had packed the trail. A quarter of a mile further on was the next set, which had caught nothing. But sprung and empty, the two traps lay on top of the snow where the wolverine had left them after it had contemptuously scratched particles of ice and snow over them to spring them. Danny's eyes were cloudy and little angry flecks washed back and forth in them as he examined the trail where the Indian devil had again disappeared into the laurel. The wolverine was not only on a trap line, but he knew that he was and apparently was determined to find and defile or spoil every trap on it. Danny left the traps where they lay and took the ax from its sheath to swing it in his hands. Damn him, he gritted. Damn his ugly hide. A fresh burst of wind, casting whirling flakes of snow before it, roared across the flat top of Stony Lonesome. Danny blinked and bent his head as he plodded forward. Ross, if he were here, would probably have some idea of what to do with an engine devil on the rampage. But Ross was not here, and whatever was to be done, Danny had to do it. The dangling chain of one of the traps in his pack caught on a bush and fell into the snow. Danny retraced his steps to pick the trap up and Red brushed against his knees. Another almost inaudible growl bubbled through the dog's throat as Danny swerved from the trail to the next set. Again, Red lunged ahead of him, plowing through the snow and snarling. Danny ran on his snowshoes, the ax in his hand raised, ready to strike. He saw the trap fox, a shining bit of red gold crouched flat in the snow and staring fixedly into the laurels. Red stopped, his body stiffened, his hackles rose and for a moment he stood on point. Then a great thunderous battle challenge rolled from his throat and he lunged forward again. Danny made a wild swing with his free hand and slipped his mittened fingers through Red's collar. Red fought the restraining hand and snarled almost continuously as he strained toward the laurel. Danny stopped, trying with his eyes to pierce the almost impenetrable brush, brush, but all he could see was the laurel. He spoke to the raging dog. Easy, take it easy. Red quieted, but stood trembling and tense. Slowly, a step at a time, they went forward. There was a momentary lull in the wind. 
Danny snapped his head erect. Behind him, a sudden rattle of steel sounded as the fox in the trap leaped sideways. Then, 20 feet away, the brush rattled. Red snarled and for a moment struggled to be free. Danny settled slowly on, down on his snowshoes and again tried to peer through the matted tangle of laurel stems. At first, he could see nothing. Then, among the boulders and snow-covered ends of the logs that were scattered through the laurel, he caught the dark sheen of fur. Danny fixed his gaze on it, and very slowly the head and forequarters of the marauding wolverine assumed distinct outline. It stood beside a log, its front paws on a rock, staring steadily at him. Then, as suddenly and silently as it had come, it was gone. Red strove forward, but Danny pulled him back. A little shiver traveled up and down his spine, and an icy hand seemed to clutch the back of his neck. Not for nothing had trackers who had encountered them considered the wolverine as the incarnation of everything evil. There had been evil in its attitude, hate in its steady stare. Danny shivered again. Come on, he murmured to Red. That thing would kill you quicker than you could kill a mouse. We gotta get that fox. Once on the trail again, Danny unbuckled Red's collar, slipped it through the ring on the end of the trap chain and put it back on the dog. He looked back down the trail toward the cabin in the beaches and again wished mightily Ross was here to guide him. He had no weapon with which he might successfully fight a wolverine. But when a man didn't have what he wanted, it was his place to make the best use of what he had. Of one thing he was certain, Red must not be allowed to go into the brush and fight the wolverine. If he did, he would be killed. Danny looked up the trail toward the overnight cabin at the end of the trap line. There might be more pelts in some of the traps, and if he did not get them today, the wolverine surely would. Beside, he and Red had never yet been run out of their mountains, not even by the huge old majesty. Of course, at least to a dog, a wolverine was much more dangerous than any bear. Most dogs knew enough to keep out of a bear's way, but would not hesitate to close with an Indian devil. But he could keep Red on the chain. Danny started up the trail, holding his hand behind him so Red would have plenty of room to walk on his snowshoe tracks. Another blast of wind rolled across the mountaintop and whirled down the slope. It left more snow in its wake, ice-edged, whirling bits of half sleet that slithered crisply along the green laurel and rattled on Danny's hood. He bent his head, keeping his eyes fixed on the left side of the trail. Ross had certainly known what he was doing when he insisted on marking all sets on one side of the trail. Three blazes meant the trap was on the left. Three blazes with a bar on top meant the right. But in a storm like this, it was right handy when a man had to look only one way. Danny looked back at his snowshoe tracks. Ten feet behind, they were already filling with snow. Red bumped his leg and looked at him through snow-filled eyes. Far off, the wind howled in a shriller key. He moved on. The next trap held a brown marten, and hope began to rise in Danny. The wolverine must have come on the trap line only that morning and had not found all the traps. Danny thrust the marten into his pack beside the fox and shouldered it to continue up the trail. He felt better. He had had every reason for leaving the mountaintop, but he hadn't left it. Ross would not have left either, and everything Ross would or would not do must be the right thing. The howling wind abated a little, but the swirling snow fell more thickly. The gray sky had added more layers of color to its overcast self. Danny took another fox from a trap and passed a half a dozen sets that were still undisturbed. As he passed a huge pine beside the trail, he nodded in satisfaction. Despite the storm, the deep snow travel, he had made good time. There was one more set between this pine and the cabin, which he should sh reach shortly after dark. Suddenly, snapping the chain taut and jerking Dan Danny's arm around, Red crowded up beside him. Now in semi-darkness, the laurel rattled and whispered mournfully as the snow beat against it and the few little breezes that had not kept pace with the gale whispered through it. 
red stood beside the trail. Hackles bristled and lips raised. Another snarl came from his throat. Danny knelt beside him and stroked the dog's ears with his mitten. Don't go off half cocked, he murmured. Easy. Red crowded very close to him, whimpering softly. While Danny reached down to unfasten the snap cover of his axe sheath. The wolverine had not deserted the trap line then, but had circled to come in from the other end. He was ahead now, possibly waiting and possibly destroying the last trap. Danny reached out to encircle the dog's neck with his arm. If it came to a fight, he and Red would fight together. But Red must not be allowed to go into the brush alone. In the gathering darkness, the laurel jungle seemed almost a solid mass on either side of the shimmering white trail. Danny glanced back toward the big pine, but its top was invisible against the night sky. With his left hand, he took a firmer grip on the trap attached to Red's collar and with the belt axe in his right, began to snowshoe up the trail. Red walked beside him, still tense and alert as he plowed through the deep snow. He stopped and strained toward the brush while again the thunderous battle challenge rumbled from his throat. <laughs> Danny paused for a fraction of a second while some cold sixth sense functioned within him. He knew that the wolverine was there, very close, and that it intended prey this time was no helpless trap creature, but himself and Red. Danny began to run, racing up the trail, half dragging Red with him. He saw the dark mass of the overnight cabin looming ahead. Danny pulled the latch spring and opened the door. He stumbled into the cabin, slammed the door behind him, and leaned, panting against it. He dropped the trap that was attached to Red's collar and heard the dog dragging it across the floor. After a few seconds, Danny took off his mitten, stooped in the darkness to unlace his snowshoe harness. He stepped out of them and reached into his pocket for a box of waterproof matches that he carried wherever he went. Striking one on the side of the box, he stepped to the table and touched the flaming match to the wick of a candle that stood upright in the neck of a syrup bottle. The candle's glare revealed in dull yellow outline every nook and corner of the cabin. It was an eight by 10 shack with a bunk at one end and a fireplace built of stone gathered on stony lonesome filling the other. A few simple cooking utensils hung on wooden pegs driven into the wall beside the fireplace and folded blankets were piled at one end of the bunk. The cabin had never been intended for anything except a sleeping place when either Ross or Danny might be at this end of the stony lonesome trap line. Danny felt for the axe on his belt and with a shock discovered that it was gone. It had been in his hand at the last place Red had scented the wolverine. He must have dropped it during the ensuing wild flight. Danny clenched his hand. A trapper did not necessarily have a gun, but an axe was almost indispensable. Well, he would have to get along without one tonight. There was a stack of wood piled beside the door. He could bring in an armload shave kindling sticks with a skinning knife and have a fire. Usually they left kindling sticks in the cabin, but the last time for some reason they had been overlooked. Red padded over to him. Danny unbuckled his collar, slipped the dragging trap from it and put the collar back on. Snow rattled crisply against the sod thatched roof and outside the angry wind was again shrieking its rage. Danny set a pan before the candle so it would not blow out when the door was opened and turned to lift the latch. The candle flickered slightly and a dull flood sounded as wind blew a loose branch against the side of the cabin. Then Red trotted to the center of the floor and stood looking at the roof. A low growl rolled from him. Danny took his hand from the latch and backed against the door. The wind was attacking in short angry charges that blasted the cabin and staggered, spent from it. But during its split-second lulls, there was another very distinct sound, something that was neither wind clawing at the thatch 
nor hard snow rattling against it, scraped on the roof. Danny listened open-mouthed. He felt sweat starting from his temples and rolled down his face. His throat tightened. The wolverine was on the roof, trying to claw a hole through it. Danny moved from the door to the center of the hut. His eyes roved about, alighting in turn upon each of the objects that held. He lifted the coffee pot and balanced it in his hand. A few bits of frozen dirt sifted through the poles that supported the thatch. Danny swung the coffee pot in a long arc. It was a poor weapon, but better than his short-bladed skinning knife. He licked his dry lips and knelt beside Red with his hand on the dog's ruff. Both th their glances strayed to the roof. Danny clenched his free hand. Even bears feared wolverines, and if this one got into the cabin. But Ross had always said that if a man didn't have what he needed, he could make out some way with what he had. Danny fumbled in his pack and moved away from Red toward the fireplace. Abruptly, the scraping on the roof ceased. There was the sound of something moving across it and a second silent. Red sprang forward and Danny warned him, stay back, back here. Red stopped. The pan that shielded the cabin fell down and the cabin's globe again filled the room. Bits of soot and dirt tumbled into the fireplace and Danny stared in terrified fascination at the wide chimney. There was a little thud, and the wolverine tumbled from the chimney into the open fireplace to stand blinking. In one mighty leap, Red bridged the distance between them and closed. Danny felt a trip hammer beat of his own heart as he ran forward with the coffee pot poised. He danced on the balls of his feet beside the fighting pair, awaiting a chance to strike. But they were rolling over and over on the floor, and Danny's heart seemed to stop beating as he saw the wolverine's powerful jaws fastened on Red's chest. He stooped with a wild stab, grasped one of the wolverine's back paws. The other plowed a bloody row of furrows down his arm. Danny jerked, and the wolverine arched its body to bring its jaws back and snap. His slashing teeth closed on Danny's trousers, and Danny kicked hard as the fighting beast fell to the floor with a strip of wool cloth in its mouth. The wolverine's foul musk filled the cabin. Danny stumbled as a little clod of chinking fell to the floor beside him. Almost at once, he was on his feet again, back to the wall. Red had not known how to fight a wolverine when he started to fight this one, but he knew now. The big setter had dived in, closed his teeth on the side of wolverine's neck, and was straining backwards. The wolverine's rage bubbled through its constricted windpipe as he strove to bring his back claws into play. But Red had learned the deadly danger of those claws and whirled aside whenever they struck. The big setter's jaws ground deeper. Danny watched the wolverine try frantically to rip the dog apart with its front paws, but they were encased in the only weapons Danny had had with which to he might have any chance of fighting this thing successfully. The two steel fox traps he had picked up and set before the fireplace when he heard the wolverine coming down it. The wolverine's breath came in wheezing gasps and Red dived in to take a firmer hold. Late the next afternoon, carrying Red across his shoulders on top of his pack, Danny stumbled into the cabin in the beech woods. He put the dog in his bed by the stove and took off his snowshoes and slipped out of his coat. Ross, who knew from long experience that many things that could happen on a trap line, waited for him to speak. He got clawed up some, Pappy, but he's all right. Mr. Hagen can even show him at another dog show if he wants. I packed him the last four miles because he was lame. He took the two foxes and Martin pelts from the pack. We got these, he said. For a moment, he stood over the pack, looking from it to the injured dog. Then, because it would not do for a trapper to boast, he lifted the last pelt out quietly. There was an engine devil, Pappy. He messed up the trap some, but we got him. Red and me got him. Oh, and there's Danny carrying Red on his shoulders. Chapter 10, 
Sheila McGuire. The winter warms swiftly on, with January bringing its cold and February great feathery drifts of snow. Ross and Danny were out every day from before dawn until dark and stretched furs in the fur shed, reached into a long line from one end to the other and back again. Ross took